Good morning and uh, welcome to this Good Friday morning service. Uh, normally on Good Friday morning, churches together in the area would gather uh, for a walk of witness carrying across from one church to another. And this year that would have been from St. James's Church up to All Saints Church. So let's, in our minds this morning, travel in our imagination, starting down in Clanfield at St. James's Church in the presence of a cross on, with a crown of thorns on it in the churchyard there. I will progress in our minds at least with a series of reflections and Bible readings through our parishes to end up at All Saints Church. A reading from Mark's Gospel. As soon as it was morning, the priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realised that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified.
a reflection from the perspective of Pilate. Truth, I said. <laughs> what is truth? No, I wasn't trying to be clever, despite what some people may tell you. I really meant it. For I'd encountered so many over the years, convinced I had the answer. Each swearing blind they knew best, party to some special knowledge denied to others. Well, they couldn't all be right, could they? And the way I see it, none of them were. Some were downright crazy, others well-intentioned but misguided, a few with genuine insights to offer, but none of them had the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Life just isn't like that, black and white. And anyone who thinks otherwise is potentially dangerous, or the makings of a dictator or a fanatic. Believe me, I've been down that road myself. So when this Jesus fellow trotted out the same old refrain, you can understand my being sceptical. Quite simply, I'd heard it all before. Or at least that's what I thought. Only it soon became apparent there was more to this man than met the eye. Something quite out of the ordinary. I'd expected him to launch straight away into some diatribe, uh, as they always do. To tell me why he was right and I was wrong. But he didn't. He just looked at me with an expression that left me mystified. Unlike anything I'd seen before. None of the usual cocktail of fear and bravado laced with a liberal dash of resentment. Not even the remotest suggestion of it. Instead, there was what seemed like pity, concern, even compassion. As though he was genuinely disappointed that I didn't understand. As if he longed for my eyes to be opened. As though he actually cared about how I responded. It threw me completely. I don't mind admitting it. After all, I was the one conducting the trial. At least, that's how it should have been. It didn't feel that way. It was as though my life were being weighed in the balance and found sadly wanting. Ridiculous. A man in my position to feel I had to answer to some Judean nobody. But try as I might, I just couldn't shake the feeling off. And the more I tried to wriggle off the hook, the more hopelessly impaled I became. Do you still ask, what is truth? I don't. For I know the answer. Now I saw it there that day in the eyes of that man. And I wish to God I hadn't. For it has haunted me ever since. The knowledge that for the first time in my life. I had the chance to make a stand. To commit myself. To something that really mattered. And I let it slip through my fingers for fear of the consequences. I held the difference between life and death in my hands that day, his fate in my hands. And I decided finally on death. The trouble is, I'm not sure whose fate we're talking about. His or mine. And the 
crowd called for Barabbas to be freed, a reflection from the perspective of Barabbas. Do you know, I still can't believe my luck. Still, after all this time, I can't believe that I got off that day scot-free. What on earth possessed the mob to let me off the hook and send Jesus to the cross? I'll never make sense of it. All right, so I wasn't a follower of his. My way, more one of force rather than persuasion. But I couldn't even help being impressed by the man. He was so clearly innocent, any fool could see that. A good man, through and through, sincere, gentle, honest, refusing to compromise his convictions, despite the torment they put him through. The very idea of him inciting revolt was frankly laughable. Yeah, maybe he had stirred up the crowd's expectations through his signs and wonders, allowed them to believe he was the promised Messiah. But what of it? He was hardly a revolutionary, was he? Not in the sense I wish he'd been anyway. Rebellion, that last thing in his mind. I knew it. They knew it. So why turn against him? Why hand him over to the enemy to be butchered like a common criminal? And let me, a known troublemaker, wriggle off the hook. It just didn't add up. Yeah, that's what they did. And the strange thing is, he made no attempt to defend himself. No attempt to expose the ludicrousness of the charges or explain the true natures of his claims. You might almost have thought he wanted to die the way he acted. <laughs> Not that I'm complaining. I wouldn't be here now had things worked out differently. Only, I can't help wondering sometimes what actually went on that day. Whether there was more going on than anyone realised. Some hidden force at work. It should have been me instead of him. Anyone rather than a man like that. But it wasn't. He suffered the punishment I deserved. By some strange twist of fate, his death buying me freedom. It's a mystery, isn't it? So here we find ourselves in our walk in our minds at South Lane Meadow. An open space, a space of limited freedom at the moment, a space where we are able to exercise at a time of lockdown. Uh, that offers a freedom denied to so many. I received a prayer request this morning and part of that was associated with someone locked in a small flat in London. They've been there for a month because of medical circumstances. So some of us are locked down more intently than others. But just in our minds to be in that space. Out in the sunshine, surrounded by that greenery as we continue our reflections together. and a reflection from one of that baying mob. What got him to us that day? Can he make sense of it? I look back now incredulous. 
unable to believe we could have been so false, so fickle. One day protesting our undying loyalty, and the next baying for his blood like a pack of wolves. Yet that's what we did. Our cries of, Hosanna! In just a few days turning to, Crucify! Our shouts of welcome to jeers of rejection. It was partly, I suppose, born of disappointment. The truth slowly dawning on us that Jesus wasn't the sort of Messiah we expected. His kingdom of an altogether different nature from the one we looked for. That was a blow undoubtedly, for many of us, me included, really believed he was the one we waited for. The promised deliverer who would set us free from the yoke of Roman oppression. Then, of course, there was fear, for we were well aware that the Pharisees were watching us, their beady eyes on the lookout for anyone less than enthusiastic in their cause. We all knew it wouldn't take much for us to suffer the same fate as Jesus. Yet deep down, those are only excuses, incidental to the main cause. The ugly fact is this, we followed the crowd, caught up in the hysteria of the moment until we blindly followed the one next to us like a bunch of sheep. It all happened so quickly, that's a chilling thing. One moment we're the same, rational human beings, and next no longer people at all, simply part of a faceless crowd, a senseless, soulless mob, all reason forgotten, all sanity suspended. I thought I was different, able to think for myself, make my own decisions, resist the pressure to compromise. But I learned the hard way that I wasn't. I caught a glimpse of the person I really am, and I'm still st struggling to take it in. Do you know what bothers me most, though? It's how Jesus must have felt as he stood there, listening to our shouts and the truth dawned on him, that he was wasting his life on people like us. It must have all but finished him. The only surprise is he didn't realise it sooner, for he saw everything else so clearly. But he couldn't have done, could he? Or he'd have called a halt somewhere. It stands to reason. Yes, I know he was special, no question about it but no one in their right mind would have gone to their death for us, had they seen us that day, had they witnessed what we were really like. Not even Jesus would do that, surely. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him, and they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him, and when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not drink it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see which, what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you, who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see 
and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And so in our journey of the mind from St James through South Lane Meadow, now we come to the shops so just think for a moment of the businesses around there. Businesses that are struggling, that have had to close, that have seen everything taken away. Businesses that are still open, serving us with courage in the midst of coronavirus, each with their own different ways of approaching our safety, but all of them face to face with us. Think of the different way that life is expressed at the moment, the new patience we learn as we socially distance one from another. And just think for a moment on all those who are unable to share even in the freedom of that. Lord, we just pray for our local businesses. On this Good Friday, as we remember your journey to the cross, Lord, you carry such a burden for us and we know that many of these businesses are carrying a burden for us too, a burden of service in the midst of coronavirus. Lord, we ask you to bless them and also to uphold all of those who are facing such uncertainty with doors shut and unable to do what their vocation calls them to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so we journey on with a reflection from one of the crowd witnessing Jesus carrying his cross to Golgotha. It was heartbreaking to see him, to watch the man we'd come to love collapsing in agony, to witness our dreams founder with him, lying broken in the dust. Suddenly, our world was in pieces, for it was impossible not to look back and remember his words in happier days, words which had seemed so full of promise. Come to me, he had said, all you that are weary, and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What could we make of that now? as he staggered under the weight of that cross, crushed by burden, scarcely able to stand, finally able to carry it no longer. It challenged everything, all we had seen and heard, all we'd come to believe. For how could it be the man who healed the sick, broken beyond recognition, the one who'd forgiven sins, convicted as a common criminal, the Messiah, who'd promised life facing the darkness of death. We stood there horrified, unable to make sense of what was happening. Why doesn't he do something, we asked. He has the power, so why not use it? Surely now, of all times, called for one of his signs and wonders, another of those miracles which had captivated the multitudes throughout his ministry. What was he waiting for? Why the delay? 
We just couldn't work it out. Only then he turned and looked at us, a slow, sad smile touching his face. And I could see the sorrow he felt was not for him, but for us. The pain we had yet to bear, the sorrow we still had to endure as part of this bleeding, broken world, a world he had come to heal through his dying. It was still heartbreaking to watch, despite that knowledge, more awful than I can ever tell you. But it was no longer a mystery, not to me anyway. He could have walked away as I'd hoped he might do, sparing himself the agony and degradation, but he didn't. He took the way of the cross, bearing our burdens, carrying our punishment, enduring our darkness, dying our death. And I understood that he'd produced a miracle after all, the greatest sign and wonder we could ever ask for. Another reading from the Gospel according to Mark. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provide for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. Our journey of the mind continues from within the shops along the road into the area of the Lith, another open area, an area of beauty. As we continue our walk, carrying a cross, sharing the burden between us in this virtual imaginary walk, coming to the bottom of the hill, ready to start the turn, the walk uphill towards All Saints Church. Let me just pause for prayer. Lord, we're each of us in our separate places, wherever we are, within parishes, within town, within the UK. And yet we are all unified by the reality of what happened on that tree, that day, on the cross. The burden you took. The it is finished completion as you felt and knew your forsakenness. Lord, 
the amazing thing you did for all of us. We just thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now a reflection from the perspective of Mary Magdalene. He was gasping, his breath coming short and sharp, his body contorted in agony, and I could scarcely bring myself to watch. It's a dreadful business, crucifixion, at the best of times, even when the poor wretch up there deserves to die. But when it's a friend, a loved one, someone who's been special to you, then I'm telling you, it's indescribable. To stand by helpless as the pain takes hold, as the muscles tear and the tendons snap, as life ebbs out of the body. To see the misery, the torment, the despair, and to know it must get worse before finally, in the sweet embrace of death, it gets better. You just can't imagine what that feels like. Not unless you've been there. And we were there, more's the pity. Each of us enduring our own private hell. We wanted to run, God knows, to close our eyes and pretend it wasn't happening. But we couldn't, could we? For he needed us then more than ever. Simply to know we were there. That we cared. That he wasn't alone. It wasn't much, I grant you. The few of us huddled together, watching nervously from the shadows, fearful of recognition, that it was enough. One ray of sunshine in a wilderness of darkness. For he knew that despite our faults, the weakness of our faith and feebleness of our commitment, we were risking something, sticking our necks out of love of him. He was gasping, and we prayed it wouldn't be much longer before release finally came. But however it might cost us, we resolved to stay to the bitter end. It was the very least we could do. And one more reflection from the perspective of Mary, mother of Jesus. He was thinking of me even then. I couldn't believe it. Despite everything he was going through, that awful stomach churning agony, which seemed to pierce my very soul. He was concerned more about my welfare than his. Yet I shouldn't have been surprised. It was so like Jesus, the way he'd been from a boy, always putting others before himself. I dared to hope this once, just this once, it would be different. But for the first time in his life, he'd look after number one. Why not? Would it have been so wrong? He'd given enough already, hadn't he? Scarcely a moment to himself. The crowds always with him, clamouring, calling, pleading, demanding, enough to break any lesser man. And, as if that wasn't enough, his enemies had been there stalking him, unable to conceal their hatred, watching his every move, waiting for their moment. He knew what they were up to, yet he continued to murmur, he continued without a murmur of complaint, always having time, always ready to respond. Nothing and no one outside his concern. I saw him so many times just about all in, drained to the point of exhaustion, and I can't tell you how much it troubled me to see my wonderful lad pouring himself out in a constant act of sacrifice 
pushing himself to the very limit. But it was useless to argue. I tried it sometimes, and he simply smiled at me in that gentle way of his, knowing I understood full well that there was no other way. He was right. I knew that. And I knew equally there was no way he'd come down from that cross. But I could still hope, couldn't I? Pray that I might be wrong. He was thinking of others even then. Not only me, but a common thief hanging there beside him. My fellow women sobbing their hearts out. Even those who'd hounded him to his death. Thinking in fact of everyone except himself. And so we arrive in our minds just across the way here from the vicarage to All Saints Church to gather at the end of this imaginary walk to bring the cross to its place where it will stand through Good Friday into Easter Sunday. We reflect on the walk we've taken and on the days to come and the events to come. join in prayer when we are slow to follow the example of Christ Lord forgive when we fail to be known as Christ's disciples Lord forgive and we turn from walking the way of the cross Lord forgive Father, by the death of your Son, forgive us and strengthen us to live in the power of your Spirit all our days. Amen.
and so our journey of the mind is complete and we've shared that journey to the cross please do come back at two this afternoon when we'll spend an hour of quiet reflection with readings and prayers and reflections for that final hour leading up to three o'clock the hour that Jesus died on the cross and now as we go a blessing the blessing of God Almighty